Hello, and welcome to Power Scores Live Online GRE Math Secrets webinar. I, again, am Ryan, one of your two instructors. Uh, I'll be rocking the mic while our second instructor, Katie, will be primarily covering the chat. And where we want to begin here is just by taking a look at what's going to be tested in GRE Quantitative, or as it is formally titled, uh, the GRE Quantitative Reasoning Measure. Now, broadly, there are two things that are going to be tested. Pre-college math skills. Pre-college math, uh, for purposes of the GRE, stops prior to pre-calculus. So you're not going to have to do any sine or cosine. There's not going to be any imaginary numbers, and they're not going to go into calculus or any, anything higher than that. Right? And this focus really is going to be on uh, testing your mathematical problem-solving ability. So this this content here, the pre-college math, is being used as a common knowledge base, something that the test makers can be confident that all of the test takers will have some exposure to, because there's no college math curriculum exactly. Uh, it varies the types of uh, courses that, that folks will take. Some people just take a college algebra course and they're done, you know, and others may take several levels of calculus. It just kind of depends on what your major is, right? So there is no such thing as college math exactly uh, for them to use. So they reach back further, right? Earlier than your undergraduate career, back to high school and even some junior high math concepts. And with that, then again, what the test makers have is uh, a means, a common knowledge base for tapping into some higher level skills that's been deemed important for success in graduate school. Right? Because, yeah, it's not really terribly important that you can go back in time to a high school math class or a junior high school math class and do really well in order to succeed in grad school. It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? But, right, using that content to test these sort of higher level skills, this has a stronger relationship to success in, in, uh, in grad school, a stronger relationship than, again, just how you would do if they tossed you back into a high school math or, or junior high school math class. Now, the four areas of math that they're going to be using target, test, or problem-solving skills, arithmetic, algebra, geometry, data analysis. And those are the four broad areas. There are more specific subtopics, uh, for instance, with arithmetic, properties of integers like odd and even, negative and positive, uh, divisibility, multiple, stuff like that. With algebra, quadratic equations, linear equations, and coordinate geometry. And then in the area of geometry, polygons, we're talking about here your standard 2D shapes, uh, triangles, squares, rectangles, and then data analysis, some basic level statistics, uh, tables and graphs, some probability and counting. Again, all of this high school level or, or earlier, not like pre-calculus or later sorts of math. And you can see a list of all of the topics and the subtopics um, that they're going to be uh, testing on the exam. They're expecting you to know in preparation for the GRE. It's about a 100-page PDF that's put out by ETS, the maker of the exam. And the good things about it are that it's free. Right? You just go download it, and it's quite thorough. and tells you those four main areas uh, and the subtopics that tend to come up. There are some cons to this, believe it or not. Uh, one, the, the official GRE math review actually includes some formulas that you really don't need to know for the exam. So it's, it's a little misleading. Uh, we'll actually take a look at um, one of these formulas, the quadratic formula, if you can remember that from your high school algebra class. They also give some demonstrations of how to calculate standard deviation, uh, which would be something for data analysis. But on the exam, you're never going to have to calculate standard deviation. So again, it's a little misleading that in the official GRE Math Review, they give an example of that. Um, the other con here to uh, the official GRE math review is that the presentation is rather dry, it's technical, it's, it's textbook-like in the explanations that are provided in the examples as you get. And the thing is, there's a big difference between textbook math and GRE math. As hopefully you were, you were gathering from what I said earlier, this is, this is not a high school math test. They reach back right, to high school and, and earlier math curriculum so that's simply to form a college, common knowledge base 
something they can count on all test takers to know so they can evaluate your problem solving skills. So the problems themselves are going to be different uh, from what you would encounter in a textbook, the sort of stuff that would have been typical of your high school math homework. Right? Um, with those textbook problems, it was usually pretty straightforward, not terribly tricky. You had formulas. You had these step-by-step -step routines that you practiced over and over, that you saw your teacher do on the board over and over. And so long as you absorb those, right, you could you know, pretty mechanically kind of move through your homework and your assignments and, and arrive at the solutions. And rarely um, were your textbook problems, your high school math homework and such, rarely uh, was it multiple choice. Instead, the expectation was that you were going to show all of your work, right, demonstrate that you've memorized these formulas and can go through these these step-by-step -step routines that you get full credit right for for your homework with the jury problems again not so much like that they're more complicated less straightforward straightforward sometimes they're even kind of puzzle like formulas and routines uh, while they're important to know and they're going to come in handy in, in some instances they they can in some problems as we'll we'll see in some examples we look at uh, those formulas, those routines, that almost mechanical, robotic sort of stuff that you absorbed and then had to show over and over again in your homework, those things can slow you down uh, in some instances. And most of the problems for the GRE are going to be multiple choice. You know, nobody's checking your work. There's, there's simply a machine that takes and automatically reviews your answer choices to determine whether you picked the right thing or not. So a couple of examples here to help illustrate this contrast. We got a sort of a textbook geometry problem here. You are given the dimensions of a rectangular room, 12 feet by 25 feet, and you're asked to calculate the perimeter and to calculate the area. Over here, it's similar. Right? Talking about here the perimeter of a rectangular room, 74 feet, so the perimeter is already provided. We're not asked for it. We're given the length, that's 12, and we're asked to calculate the area. So we can see similar concepts in the jury problem to what we find over here in the textbook problem. But again, the presentation is a little bit different, and the solution that we're going to work through is a little bit different. In either case, uh, we're using a basic formula to calculate uh, the perimeter of the rectangle, twice the length plus twice the width. In the textbook problem, it's really just a matter of plugging in the dimensions and doing the arithmetic. Likewise, for calculating the area, we've got our area formula, length times width. We plug in the dimensions that were provided, and we do the math and we're done. It's not quite so straightforward over here. We are going to use the perimeter formula, okay, but we um, are going to need to solve for the width here because that wasn't directly provided. So they gave us, um, we'll say this is the length, right? Um, and we're given the perimeter, and we use this formula here to find the width. And then with both dimensions in sight, we can take and calculate the area. So similar concepts, right? We even are using the same formulas. But the execution, the solution here, right, we can see is quite different. Here's another good example. What we've got here is some textbook looking algebra. We've got a couple of equations here, a couple of variables. We're asked to find uh, what this, uh, this third expression here is equal to. Now, if we're thinking in terms of a textbook solution, uh, the habit is the habits that you developed in your high school math classes, little routines that you went through over and over again, a matter of uh, isolating and solving for individual variables. So we can take one of these two equations that we're given and get R in terms of S. As we add S uh, to both sides and we find that R equals S plus 3. What that means is that we can come back to this other equation over here, R times S equals 5, and in place of R, we can substitute what we just solved for, S plus 3. So now we've got S plus 3 times S is equal to 5. You take and distribute your S. S times S is S squared. 3 times S is 3S. And now we can subtract 5 from both sides. And we got something here that you might recognize. It's a quadratic equation. It has the standard form AX squared plus BX plus C. In this case, our A value would be 1, right? There's just a sort of a hidden 1 there uh, in front of the S squared. Our B value would be 3, and the C value would be negative 5. Now, you might remember FOIL from your high school algebra classes, a little mnemonic device. Let's write it up here on the board. 
FOIL stood for first, outer, inner, last. When you've got a quadratic equation, the, um, the part to the left of the equal sign, which is called a polynomial, you can do FOIL in reverse, where you would pull out a, a pair of factors that would FOIL together to give you this. But there are some quadratic equations where you can't do that reverse FOIL method uh, to find your solutions. You'd have to use the quadratic formula. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, when you look at the official GRE math review, they actually include the quadratic formula in there. Um, so you could, right, thinking you know, this is what the GRE math review says, you could go through this sort of routine here. You could use the quadratic formula, take and um, plug in your values for A, right, that's 1, and for B, and that's 3. And then for C, that would be negative 5. And what you get, going through these calculations of quadratic formula, you get that S is approximately equal to 1.2 or negative 4.2. And with that, you can come back to this equation up here. Right? You can plug in, let's go with the positive value of S. You can plug that in. So you can solve for the approximate value of R. And now that we've solved for our individual variables, right, this is a thing that we know so well from, uh, from our high school math classes. Now that we've solved for our individual variables, uh, we can take and plug them into this expression here and figure out what it's equal to. And because we're working with approximations, all right, we end up here with like roughly 15.12, which would be closest to C. All right. Here's the wonderful thing, though. Despite the fact that the quadratic formula appears in the official jury math review. Um, despite the fact that this would seem the most natural thing to do based on what you learn and practice so often in your high school math classes, all this, this is not work that you needed to do to solve this problem. The GRE solution. You look at this and you say, I'm given some information in the if part. I'm given these two equations right here. And what I'm given is supposed to be all I need to take and figure out what this is equal to. So I figure, okay, there's a connection between these equations and this one. And one way to take and explore that connection, right, and arrive at, at your correct answer is to go through all this mess, right? That's one way to understand the connection. But a better way to think about it is, well, you know, I can put these two together to get this. That's very roughly speaking, what we did here. We took these two and sort of combined them. We worked with them together in order to find our, our values for individual variables. Well, maybe there's a simpler way, you know, that we can put these together here. And when I look at the third expression that I'm, I'm supposed to solve for, and I see these powers, okay, powers, exponents, you know, that indicates multiplication. Maybe what's going on here is I just need to take the RS and the R minus S and multiply them together. And you can test this out. You can say, is, you know, is that the connection? And you've got good reason to suspect it, right? Again, despite what you see in the official jury math review, they're not gonna make you do this. You are not going to need the quadratic formula on these. Right? So if you start thinking about using it, you're heading on the, down the wrong path. Instead, look at these more basic, almost kind of obvious connections. We've got all the same variables, R and S, R and S, R and S. We've got these powers over here that indicate some multiplication, right? So let's just check and see. You know, maybe I can multiply those together. And you can. It will work. When you do RS times R, you got R times R, that's R squared, and then the S hanging on there, right? And when you do RS times negative S, S times negative S, that's going to give us that S squared, the negative is hanging on there, and our R is hanging on right there. So it works, right? This is a, a connection that seems so obvious, so simple, right, that you would overlook it, particularly given that you were trained, you were taught, right, to deal with and work through and demonstrate all this complexity, right? This is what you were rewarded for in your high school math classes. This is what they wanted to see. This was you learning. This is you demonstrating mastery. On the GRE, this is you demonstrating mastery. Right? So we we suspected this simple connection. We checked it, right? Works out. And now we do 
good substitution. We're still using some basic algebra skills here, right? Rs is equal to 5. R minus S is equal to 3. So I can just as well say that 5 times 3 is equal to this expression. That 15 is equal to it. And you got your answer. And it's an exact answer at that, right? No, no rounding, no decimal values here. So let me stop just a second, right? Because you, you just encountered here a wall of math. And for some people, you, you might have started sweating just a little bit, right? Remembering this stuff from high school, worrying, oh my gosh, this is what I got to do. And then, and then came the relief, I hope, of something so simple here. But let's, let's stop a moment to process, digest, and take any questions, if you have any questions. Right, I'm here, ready to answer. Katie, also, right, active in the chat. If there are no questions just yet, no worries. Let's proceed. Let's talk more about what it takes to be a GRE problem solver. Right, you get a sense of what it takes. Um, and just a preview, yeah, you need to know some math. We have been doing a little algebra. We did with our simple geometry example earlier. We used some formulas. Right? We're learning about the exam. Right? We're learning in that it's not going to be quite as complicated, perhaps, as uh, some of your high school math homework. And what's really important here are some strategies. Right? Good problem solvers have strategies. So the test content, or the math concepts, had a quick overview of that earlier. Arithmetic, algebra, geometry, data analysis. Uh, there are various facts and formulas and even some routines yeah, that you're going to want to practice, you're going to want to know, and be ready to apply on the exam. But you also want to be aware of the structure of these questions. You know, we're, we're familiar with standardized tests, having taken you know, a few of them throughout our education. And, and we know that sometimes we can you know, take advantage of certain features of the exam. Multiple choice, for instance, right? Who among us hasn't done a little answer choice elimination when they were doing multiple choice, whether it was on a standardized test or on just like a test for one of your classes? Multiple choice is everywhere, right, throughout our education. We found ourselves in some cases where we weren't immediately sure what the correct answer was, so we started trying to narrow some things down. You know, that's taking advantage of the structure of the question. And it's something that we're going to explore a little bit more as we go along here. But it's just a, a quick illustration of how, yeah, you, you want to more, know more than just the content. You want to know the format because there are some strategies, some approaches that you can use that, again, take advantage of standardized features of the standardized test. And then the strategies. Right? This is a long list that we've got here, and it's not even a complete one. There are more strategies that we could explore, but in the time that we have, we've got to, we've got to stick to uh, this short list. And uh, one of them you've seen already. Do the easy math. Because the easy math very often will be there for you to do. And when we had that quadratic problem earlier, right, our inclination is to do the hard math. Again, to sort of slog through all that complexity, to do all that work and use that formula. Because again, that's what we were taught and that's what we were rewarded for in our high school math classes. That's what we had to do right, to make the grade. On the exam, though, you know, they structure these problems a lot of times so that there's easy math for you to work through. Right? Because it's not so much about did you memorize some formula, you know, particularly some really complicated formula like quadratic formula. It's not, it's not about that. Um, it's about problem solving, and a lot of times to keep the focus on problem solving, they'll keep the arithmetic and the algebra on the simpler side. It may not appear that way, right? I assure you, but... There are a lot of times to be some easy math there for you to do, and you want to look for it. Um, but when it comes to algebra, when it comes to variables on the exam, you know, there are some, some really classic strategies that, that you can use here that we'll explore, taking advantage of the multiple choice format, uh, replacing variables with numbers that we take and, and supply that we pick out. Here again, analyzing the answer choices, this is something we'll explore. We're talking about uh, taking advantage of the multiple choice format. This one is um, one that a lot of times folks aren't so familiar with. It's, it's kind of like a core strategy for an effective problem solver, being able to look at a problem and think of something simpler. You're given something difficult, complex, right? 
is there sort of a simpler version of this problem that I could tackle first? And in doing that, kind of opens the door to adapting your solution and tackling the more difficult problem you're presented with. And there's some standard stuff here, like translating words to math. This, we did plenty of this, right? We were doing word problems for our classes. Facts and formulas, those are going to come in handy too, right? This is, this is something that you'll think of. Um, and this is almost more than a strategy. It's almost like a mantra right? for you to repeat to yourself when you're preparing for the GRE, when you're, when you're thinking about what's most important. And it's putting concepts before calculations. It's, it's not so much about can you do lots of complex and tedious, um, messy sort of formula calculations. It's about do you understand the concepts and can you move fluidly through these concepts, reasoning your way to the solution. Bearing in mind that this is called the quantitative reasoning measure. So let's see some examples, right? Let's let's see all these strategies. We already saw the the do the easy math one, right? Look for and 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 try to do that easy algebra, either arithmetic. Let's check out some others. And speaking of word problems, we've got we have a classic setup right here. It says two trains depart different terminals at the same time and travel toward each other. Train S moves at a constant rate of 60 miles per hour. Train T moves at a constant rate of 90 miles per hour. If two trains start 450 miles apart and ride straight parallel tracks over flat terrain, how many miles will train S have traveled when it meets train T? So you, you've got this, um, this assumption here that sort of removes all the, the messiness of the real world. They're riding straight parallel tracks over flat terrain. And this allows us to go through some really clean mathematical steps Indeed, we could go a kind of a classic route with this classic problem. We could translate those words into algebra and use some facts and formulas, particularly the uh, rate formula or distance formula. Right? Distance equals rate times time. Using this formula, we can set up a couple of equations here. One that allows us to calculate the distance for train S, right? We know train S is moving 60 miles per hour. We don't have a value for T, but we're going to return to that in just a second. We can set up the right, same equation, right? Using distance equals rate times time. Set up an equation here to solve for the distance for train T. Okay. Now about that T value there, about that time value. Well, they're departing at the exact same time. And driving on these straight parallel tracks, when they meet, they will have been driving for the exact same time. So while I don't have a specific number here to pop in for T, I know that T is going to be equal in these two equations. Because again, they're leaving at the same time, and when they meet, they will have traveled for the exact same amount of time. So I can put these two together to make this equation. 450. That's the total distance, combined distance, these trains will travel. Right? So train T starts from its side, train S starts from its side, and when they meet, they will have together covered the 450 miles between them. And again, they will be traveling for the exact same amount of time, having left at the exact same time. And we can solve for T now with this equation. And with that value of T set, you know what we're going to do find how many miles train S traveled, we take that value, and we plug it back into that equation. So with this classic problem, we could indeed take a sort of classic approach, use that distance formula, right, translating our words into algebra, setting up our equations, solving for our variable, right, and in the end, finding the correct answer. That's one way to do this. But there's another way. We can analyze the answer choices, taking advantage of the multiple choice format. We can modify this problem slightly, to make it a little simpler, a little easier for us to tackle, and then having gained some insight into the problem, adapt our solution. And we'll even do a little translation here, but instead of going words to algebra, we're going to go words to a diagram. So. You, know, you might think the diagrams are, are just for geometry, right? Redrawing triangles and circles and stuff on your scratch paper, but something like this can be easily diagrammed. We're talking about a, a spatial relationship, right? the distance between two points. You know, it's, it's really kind of like you know, lines and angles geometry. So we could 
we can sketch out this little diagram on our scratch paper. There's our parallel tracks, perfectly straight on flat terrain. Uh, S over here and T over there. With 450 miles between S and T, the halfway mark would be 225. Now here's where we work with a simpler problem. In the problem as stated, S and T are traveling at different speeds. In a simpler problem, they would be going the same speed. Now this is already given. So we know they're traveling for the exact same amount of time. They leave at the same time, right? Riding their straight parallel tracks. When they meet, they will have traveled for the exact same amount of time. So this is already given. The same rates part, that's where I took and said, let me try solving a simpler problem first. And instead of 60 and 90, I just assumed that this is equal as well. If they're traveling for the exact same amount of time, at the exact same speed, then they must have gone the exact same distance. They would meet right, at the halfway point. Now we adapt. Right? Now we adapt. And the problem, as stated, again, it's same times different rates. So we know that it couldn't be the same distance. It would have to be different distances. Now look at the difference in the rates. Train T's go in faster. Train S is going slower. So again, in the simpler scenario, they would meet exactly in the middle. They would travel the exact same distance, 225. In the scenario as written, we know that T going faster than S must have gone a little further than S. So that tells us then that train S must have gone less than 100 or less than 225 miles. Train S must be just short of that halfway mark. And the neat thing about the solution with the multiple choice format, it works out so that even though we didn't calculate the exact answer the way that we did with uh, the last approach, uh, we were still able to figure out exactly what the answer is because we were to eliminate all but one of our options. And what we did here is analyze the answer choices. Right, so you saw our approach all together. We had, let's hop back to it. We had to translate words to diagram. That's the first thing we saw. Solving a simpler problem and adapting solution. We saw that. And then the final step was analyzing the answer choices. Right? What we figured out was that the correct answer has to be less than 225. So what you do is you eliminate anything that's less than 225. And here again, conveniently, that narrows things down to exactly one option. So the strategies that we just used here in the solve a simpler problem, adapt the solution, you saw that what I did is I changed some numbers, right, to make the math easier, to make the problem simpler. And when I did that, of course, it didn't take me directly to the solution. It got me an answer that was incorrect. It got me 225, but I didn't rush to pick that. I understood the strategy that I was applying here involved some simplification, involved right, potentially arriving at something other than the correct answer. Then right, I adapted. But with this, this process here of trying to tackle a simpler problem first, right, you gain some insight into how the problem works, and you can find yourself reasoning your way to the correct answer clarifying perhaps some steps, right, that you, you might need to uh, uh, follow in the original. And the translating words to the diagram, again, as I already said, you know, you might think the diagrams are just for geometry, but they can work for basically any spatial relationship where you might find it handy to kind of draw out a picture. Again, these rate problems where there's distances and stuff, you might find that, uh, that a diagram could be uh, quite useful. And then analyzing the answer choices, the way that this worked, we, uh, we identified a feature the correct answer had to have. In this case, we figured out the correct answer had to be less than 225. And then we eliminated anything that lacked that feature. Again, the essential or defining or necessary feature of the correct answer was that the value be less than 225. 
we'll find there are some some other problems for analyzing the answer choices. You know, we, we think about something that the correct answer must not have. And again, we eliminate. Right? Now, um, the thing is about that problem, they won't always so easily kind of yield to that analyze the answer choices approach. So we saw here, using that approach, we were able to narrow it down to exactly one. It would be awesome if it always worked out that way, but it won't necessarily work out that way. So we've got another example here where we can do some analyzing the answer choices to help us narrow things down. It's not going to get us down to just one option, but it's going to cut out a lot of these. So this problem here, we've got some arithmetic. It's testing our knowledge of exponents and, uh, and number properties, positive, negative, stuff like that. But instead of x is positive, negative x less than y is less than zero, then which of the following must be negative? Well, first we're going to use some facts and formulas. Then we're going to analyze the answer choices. And then we're going to take and remove some of these variables and replace them with numbers. So first, the facts and formulas part, a rule that you need to know, basic rule of arithmetic, rule of exponents, anything squared is going to be non-negative. Right? Anything squared is going to be equal to or greater than zero. So for instance, zero squared would be equal to zero, and then one squared would be one, negative one squared would be one. Again, anytime you square, you're going to end up with something non-negative. We're asked which of the following must be negative. Well, based simply on this rule, we can analyze and eliminate these three answer choices. You want to get rid of anything that is positive or zero. And this rule tells us these are out. Because A, B, and C, it's all squaring. So we analyzed the answer choices. We didn't narrow it down to one. It doesn't always work that way, but we narrowed it down to two. And what we'll do now is we'll supply some numbers. Instead of having to tackle this in a pure sort of algebra, abstract, arithmetic sort of way, we can take and just pop some numbers in here that fit the bill. We'll go with, say, you know, x equals 2, y equals negative 1. And let's see. D, does this work out? No, nope. this one doesn't work out. It says negative x is less than y is less than 0. In this case, this is not, this is not working out here. E, though, it does work out. Negative 1 squared, that's 1. Minus 4, that's negative 3. Looking good. All right. And really, after we eliminated these three and eliminated D, you could have just picked this and moved on. But you can demonstrate right, that E is going to be correct. So a good example here of how in analyzing the answer choices doesn't necessarily rule out everything. It can rule out a lot of it and get you down to correct answer. So this strategy of supplying numbers is good when you want to try and get around some difficult algebra, some abstract arithmetic as we were just grappling with. Um, since we're trying to make things simpler, easier on ourselves here, keep the numbers small to keep your, uh, keep your calculation simple. But just to be mindful of any restrictions in the problem, it might be something like x is prime or x is greater than zero. So you've you got to keep that stuff in mind when you pop numbers in there. And you can do this for variables in the question, or as we saw in our example, you can supply numbers for variables in the answer choices. Now here's another one, another quadratic equation. And this is, this is a beast of a problem. Right? This is really a high difficulty problem. Uh, a question like this on the GRE, about 60% of test takers are likely to get it wrong. But we'll see that it's, it's an easy way to get it right. It doesn't come easily. Right? It's something that, uh, that you have to acquire through practice. But yeah, this is, this is one right? that we can, we can knock out without too much sweat. What's tricky about this are the negative exponents. If there weren't any negative exponents, you know, we would do our, our FOIL stuff. And we'll explore that concept in just a minute. But with those negative exponents in place, the sort of routines that we learn in our high school math classes don't so easily apply here. Right? 
So what we're going to do is, indeed, use some facts and formulas, some more uh, uh, rules about exponents. And then again, we're going to swap variables for values. Here we're going to do something called backplugging. We're going to take the values and the answer choices and plug them back into the problem to see what fits. First, the facts and formulas. Our little rule, when you have negative exponents, you need to take and swap that negative exponent for a positive one and flip your base. Right? A is our base. We flip it. We find it's reciprocal. It would be 1 over A. Again, we change that negative exponent to a positive exponent. So this is a rule you need to know. It's a rule that uh, will be tested on the exam. So when I look at this, all right, let me, let me apply that rule. X, the negative 2, become 1 over X squared. 2X to the negative 1, that X to the negative 1 in particular, would be 1 over X to the positive 1, or simply 1 over X. Now I can go a little further here. I'm, I'm trying to set this up so that I can just plug in uh, numbers from the answer choices and quickly see whether, uh, whether the math works out. So I want to simplify this a little more. I'm going to add 24 to both sides. As you can see, we're actually getting away from quadratic form with this particular approach. The next thing that I do is I factor out a 1 over x. So the 1 over x squared, we can factor out a 1 over x there. And then the last thing, we're multiplying by 1 over x here on the, on the left. So what I do is um, just take and multiply both sides by x over 1. That's basically how this works out. Let me um, draw it up there in case you need to see it x over 1. This is the simplifying step we're doing here. x over 1. And that little move there, that's what canceled out that 1 over x on the left, leaving us with 1 over x plus 2 on the left. And over here we get 24 over x. Can't really go much further than this. In any case, this is a, this is a fine stopping point for us. And with this vastly simplified equation now, what we'll do again is try plug in these numbers back in to see what works. So when I plug in 4 for x, I end up with a false statement. Right? 1 fourth plus 2 is not equal to 24 times 4. When you use back plugging and you find that the answer choice that you plug back in gives you a false statement, you know it's a wrong answer. So we move on to b. I'm going to plug in 1 6 for x. And here again, we get a false statement. Right, 1 divided by 1, 6 gives us 6, right? 6 plus 2 does not equal 24 over 6. So we keep going. Let me try C now. We plug in negative 1, 6 for X. Moving through the math here, we get a true statement. And we don't need to go any further. All right, what we're dealing with here is multiple choice. Select 1. There's going to be exactly one correct answer. And when you're going uh, with this backplugging approach and you find a correct answer here, you can, you can safely stop on this one. Right? No need to bother with the others. We've knocked this one out. But there's still another way to do this. So I, I, I showed you an approach that still seemed a little heavy on algebra. Right? And I mean, I got to tell you, algebra is going to be in the exam. You can't avoid it entirely. You do got to have some algebra jobs. Right? You do got to be comfortable with these sorts of rules for exponents, and you do got to be comfortable doing some simplifying moves, manipulating expressions as we did here. Right. But there's a way that we could do a little easier algebra on this one. This is one where we could solve a simpler problem and adapt the solution, but still use some facts and formulas, still use that rule about uh, negative exponents. So remember I was saying that what makes this problem tricky are the negative exponents. If it wasn't negative exponents, it was just x squared and 2x, we could use our standard reverse FOIL. Get it up here. So when we're thinking just FOILing, that's when we would start with a pair of expressions like this, a pair of binomials. FOILing would mean multiplying together your x terms x times x, our first terms, gives us x squared. Multiplying together your outer terms, x times uh, negative 4 is negative 4x. 
six times x is positive six x, positive six x and negative four x give us positive two x. And then the last terms, positive six times negative four, give you negative 24. And what we're doing here, in, instead of foiling, right, beginning with the, the binomials, as they're called, and multiplying them together to get the polynomial, we do the reverse. Right? We start with the polynomial and we factor these out. And once you've got your, your pair of factors, your pair of binomials for your polynomial, you can solve for your, uh, your variable. In order for this equation to be true, x plus 6 times x minus 4 equals 0, one of these expressions is going to be equal to 0. Either x plus 6 is equal to 0 or x minus 4 is equal to 0. So with each of these, we can solve for a possible value of x. When we uh, take and solve here, subtract 6 from both sides, and that's how we get our negative 6. With the other possibility, x minus 4 equals 0, right? you add 4 to both sides, and you find another possible value of x is positive 4. Right? Now, let's pop in the, the negative 6. Let's do the arithmetic. Right? We solved for x, we've got the two, uh, two possible values, the two roots, as they're called, the technical term for quadratics. So we pop it in, and yeah, the arithmetic works out, because right, we did our algebra, correct? We got the right values here. And the thing is, with the original equation, with those negative exponents, you're going to end up with zero. Again, you're going to end up with, effectively here, positive 24. And then you subtract that 24, and you get zero. So having done the, the easier algebra, I can come back to this one now, and again, I can relate it to that simpler problem as I prepare to adapt my solution. And I think, okay, well, what would I put in for x here in order to you know, end up with this positive 24 minus 24? And you think about that rule again. And you could figure out, oh, if I had a negative 1 6 in there, right, and I apply this rule, you're going to end up with your correct answer. So the, the first approach We started by applying this rule to the equation as written, simplifying the equation, and then doing some backplugging. Right? With this approach, we solved the problem that we wish we had, right? the problem that, that the test makers intentionally deprived us of so that we couldn't you know, do the algebra so easily. We're like, all right, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the easy algebra, and I'm going to look for a relationship between that easier problem and the more difficult one that I have. And uh, then it was in our, our final step that we started thinking about that rule and thinking about how we could make this work. So backplugging, this is something that you can try in place of solving an equation. We are, again, here swapping variables for values to try and get around some difficult algebra and instead do some, some easier arithmetic. And this is only going to work when the answer choices are numbers. Right? If you've got variables in your answer choices, it's, gonna, it's not going to work. And you can use this for, for pure algebra problems, like the one that we just did, but also algebra word problems. Right? You can do some backplugging. And we're going to see an example of this in just a little bit. But let's look at a, a quantitative comparison problem. Now, these quantitative comparison problems are tough, and they make up a good chunk of the exam. Like the first seven or eight questions of the 20 that you're going to get, and just to make sure we're all clear on the numbers. So for, for quant, your score is based on two sets of 20 questions apiece. And in each of those 20 question sets, like the first seven or eight questions are going to follow this format, quantitative comparison. You have a couple of quantities, and your task is to compare them and, and determine their relationship, if that's possible. Right? Determine whether quantity A is always going to be greater or B is going to be greater, whether the quantities will always be equal, or whether, based on the information provided, you just can't pin the relationship down to one of those options. And a lot of times, quantitative comparison will provide you with uh, some data, some info above the two quantities. In this case, we've got a couple of lists. Right? 
and we're asked to compare the standard deviations of these two clips. And our strategy here is to put concepts before calculations. Uh, I was telling you earlier in the webinar, when you look at the official GRE math review, they show you how to calculate standard deviation, which is a waste of everybody's time because on the exam, you're never actually going to calculate standard deviation because that's a rather tedious and time consuming calculation. It's one that, you know, when we actually did it in school, we left it to our calculators, right? We had TI-83s with special little buttons that would take and knock that stuff out for us. On the exam, you do not get a fancy calculator. You get a very simple calculator on screen. It doesn't have any standard deviation button. And they're not going to drag you through right, performing that standard deviation calculation. Instead, they're just going to test the concept of standard deviation. Do you understand what that is? And what standard deviation is, is a measure of the distribution of data in a set, how spread out the data is surrounding the mean. So what we want to do with each list is identify the mean, and it's something that we can we can do quite easily here. Each list, we've got, um, well, it's approximately 11, I should say, and this is likewise approximately 15. Just a little correction there. The mean is approximately 11, approximately 15. What we can do here is, is we can take a look at the spread of the data. And we see, um, we see a pattern here. In the first one, we've got a sort of constant interval of four. Seven plus 11 gives us four. 11 plus four gives us 15. 15 plus four gives us 19. But then we got this, this one data point that's kind of pulling off to the left, right? Subtracting six gets us that you call it an outlier. You look at the second list. Here again, we see that constant pattern, right? A distance of four between these points. 15 minus four gives us 11. 11 minus four gives us seven. Over here, 15 plus four gives us 19. But then now here on the right side, we got this outlier. We've got this one uh, data point that's pulling off to the right. Now, while the, the means here are different, Okay, we're going to have a slightly higher mean in the second list. We're going to have a slightly lower mean in the, in the first list. You can have different means, different averages, and have the same standard deviation. Again, that's because standard deviation depends on the spread or distribution of the data around the mean. Our approximate mean here, 11, our approximate mean here, 15. And the spread of data around the mean is basically the same. Um, the thing that has changed here, as far as the uh, distribution goes, is how it's skewed. This distribution is pulling to the left, this distribution is pulling to the right, but they're basically the mirror image of one another. They have the same spread, they have to have the same standard deviation. There's no reason right, for us to try and calculate the standard deviation for each of these sets. Even just an approximate uh, value for the means was good enough. It wasn't that much calculation really required. And these these lists here, it was no sort of accident that we had this readily recognizable pattern in each distribution on the exam so that you can put concepts before calculations when it comes to standard deviation. The data will tend to be, right, particularly in short lists like this, the data will tend to be sort of simple in its construction with, again, these readily detectable patterns in the distribution that allow you to see these relationships quite readily. So with concepts before calculations, like I said, it's more than a strategy. It's almost like a mantra that, that you want to keep in mind. You want to repeat to yourself when you're preparing for the exam. You know, it's, it's more about reasoning than it is about calculating. Think about the name, again, of the GRE math section. It is formally called the GRE Quantitative Reasoning measure. So as a rule, you want to, particularly for quantitative comparison, where the focus is on the comparison and, and not so much about calculation, you want to avoid solutions that will require really complicated formulas, like we saw earlier, the quadratic formula, and time-consuming or tedious calculations. Time is short on the exam. For each of those 20 question sets that you have, you've got 35 minutes. So 
a good even pace that allowed you to work through every problem would be an average of about one minute and 45 seconds per question. If you start thinking about an approach that will require you to do calculations that would take much longer than that, you're heading down the wrong path. And the problem, uh, most assuredly, is not designed right, such that you have to do those time consuming calculations. The problem will be designed to allow you to put concepts before. Again, that's sort of really tedious, time consuming stuff. So you've seen all the strategies that we're introducing in this webinar in action. So let me work through some problems there. Now, right? you can try a few. We'll start with what hopefully is an easier one, the GRE arithmetic word problem. It's how old will a person be one year from now if our years ago the person was S years old? Before we dig in, we just Look back at the strategy slide, okay. strategies you consider. Uh, you might see some here that are useful since we've got some variables there on the problem. Okay. Maybe there's something that we can do with this strategy. Now let's jump back to it and let's try it out. Let me and Katie know what you're thinking for number five. All right, looking pretty good. See a lot of right answers coming in. So I was hinting at a strategy for this one. Supply numbers would be a good one to use here. And we're going to need to do a little standard translating, some words into arithmetic. And the reason that I think to do supplying numbers here is, while this is a rather abstract presentation, how will a person be one year from now if four years ago the person was 10 years old? You're, we're talking about stuff that we could easily do some math with if we just had some specific concrete values. You know, if somebody asked me to like calculate my age a few years ago, it wouldn't be so hard because I know like what my age is now and I've got specific numbers of years that I can work with. It's a lot easier to wrap your mind around what this problem requires if you supply some numbers. Well, let's say um, that it was two years ago, that this person was three years old. There's some small numbers, keep your math easy. So let's think about how old they are now. Right? Let's start with a simpler case. Well, it would be five now, right? Two plus three would give us right, five years old. The next step is to think about, well, what about one year from now? That means I'd be adding one year the left-hand side of my equation, and to keep things equal, I'd have to add that one to the right-hand side of my equation as well. Given these values for R and S, right now they'd be five, and a year from now then they would be six. Now our last step is to get back to the abstract presentation here uh, of the question because that's what we get in the answer choices. Let's remember that Two was just standing in for R, so let's stick that back where it belongs. Three was standing in for S, so let's get it back there. And that plus one, right, that's that was a crucial thing that we figured out, and it was easier to do that, again, when we had some specific concrete values to work with. And we've got our answer here, as many correctly figured out. Right, nicely done, nicely done. Let's try another one. The word problem here store discounted the retail price, uh, an algebra word problem, store discounted the retail price of an item by 20% and then sold the item for a profit that equaled 50% of the discounted price. If the store paid $10 for the item, what was the item's retail price? Let's think about some strategies. I'm going to bounce back to this slide here. We've got doing the easy math. Swapping variables for values, and back plugins, supplying numbers we just did, analyzing the answer choices, solving a simple problem, adapting, translating. I'll go ahead and tell you, you're going to need to do some translating. That's how it goes with word problems, right? Uh, the thing for you to figure out is are you going to go words to algebra or words to arithmetic? So let's get back to it and see what you can do here with number six.
All right. I got a couple of answers in. This is a harder problem, much harder problem. Now, I was, I was running the clock on you. I did a minute 45. It's good for you to get the feel of what that's like because come exam time, yeah, that's, that's the pace that you want to aim for, you know, about an average of a minute and 45 seconds per question. But, you know, when you're, when you're preparing for the exam, and, and that's what we're doing here, we're getting ready for the exam, just doing a little practice, you don't always have to run a clock on yourself. I'm going to get into the, the solution uh, to this and the correct answer, but um, given how few answers came in, I, guess, I think it's good for me to just say something here about timing. In your early stages of preparation for the GRE, and I, I trust that a number of you are in the earliest stages of your preparation, don't worry so much about running a clock on yourself. Right? The first thing that you need to get down when you're preparing for the GRE is accuracy. You need to be able to get questions right. And early in your prep, you're – you know, getting familiar with some concepts, getting familiar with the exam. And when you're first learning stuff, you've got to take things a little slow. This is how skill development goes. You know, you think about when you were first learning how to drive a car. You had to think very carefully and cautiously about which pedal you were going to press, you know, which way you were going to turn the wheel. Uh, but the more you practice, the more fast and fluid, right, your operation of the vehicle became. Um, or, you know, if you learn how to play uh, a sport or learn how to play an instrument, it's the same sort of thing. You know, you got to start out kind of slow, but the more you practice, the more familiar you are with your game, with your, uh, with your instrument, the more quickly and more fluidly, right, you can play the instrument, you can play the game. And the more quickly and fluidly you can solve these problems. But at first, again, don't be afraid, just take it slow. Take it at the pace that you need you to understand the problem well enough to get it right. Now, as your skills start to build, you're naturally going to start working on speed, start working on your pacing. And it's going to be important then for you to, to run a clock. And this doesn't mean you have to do like full-time practice tests over and over and over again. You can do just little short sets of questions. You can do just five questions, right? A little speed trial, see how your pacing is. You can do 10 questions. You can do a set of 20 questions to uh, simulate, right, what you're going to face on the exam. And as you're going from accuracy to speed, right, naturally then you're going to move into endurance, and you're going to need it on exam day. Right? Your exam appointment is like four and a half hours. The test is long. Uh, it's not enough for you to be able to get questions correct. You know, it's not enough to have accuracy. It's not enough for you to be able to maintain a fairly brisk pace, you know, an average of a minute and 45 seconds per question. You've got to keep this up for a while, you know. And these are, again, stages that you're sort of naturally going to transition through in your prep. And if right now, right, a minute 45 wasn't quite long enough for you to get this question right, do not feel bad, okay? You're going to get there. You're going to gradually, naturally move there, and you'll even find yourself getting these questions right, getting at a brisk pace, and keeping it up for hours, just as you'll need to do on exam day. So I want to just zoom out a minute and talk about that. Now let's, let's zoom back in, talk about this problem. Good strategy for this would be back plugging. We've got uh, a, sort of an algebraic word problem, and I'll show you just how algebraic in a second. Uh, but our answer choices are all numbers. You know, and, and when we look at the math that we're talking about here, it's like going to a store, discounts, paying for things. You know, this is math that we could do pretty easily if we had maybe a retail price to get us started. That's why back plugging is, is, a, is a good approach here. And, and when we do the translation, as we'll need to with this word problem, instead of working on algebra, we work on arithmetic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with option C. It's, it's going to turn out to be wrong. I'm going to start with option C, and I'm going to do arithmetic. I say, all right, let's, let's see, could $17 be the retail price? Could that be the right answer? Well, let's, let's see what happens when we discount it by 20%. Because right, they're going to take that retail price and discount it by 20%. And you get $13.60. Now, the crucial test here is um, that profit. Does that profit equal 50% of the discounted price? Well, to find our profit, we need to take the discounted price. That's $13.60. Right, so let me just label this here. That's retail. Okay, and this is discounted. Discounted again here. This is the cost. This is what the store paid for the item. And this right here, yeah, this is the profit. If 17 were the correct answer, if C were correct, 
360 would be half 1360, right? Our profit would be half of our discounted price, but that's not the case, right? Uh, 360 is less than half of 1360. Our profit here is too small. And now you can see why I started in the middle on this. The answer choices are ordered from least to greatest. We got the lowest possible retail price, you know, maybe right, turns out it's gonna be wrong, and then the highest here. When you start in the middle, if you discover, as we did, that $17 is too low of a retail price. Because again, it produces too small of a profit. 360 is not 50% of 1360. Well, if $17 is too low of a retail price to give me this, right? Then $15 is gonna to be too low. And 1250 is gonna to be too low. Starting in the middle, I don't just eliminate one answer if the middle option turns out to be wrong. I eliminate two others. And this, this is something that the test is actually designed for. Okay. They facilitate, the test makers facilitate this sort of answer choice elimination by ordering the options. They'll have them from lowest to highest or highest to lowest, but they're never just gonna give you just a jumble of numbers. They're not gonna have a, a 10 here and a two there and a 1,000 here. No, never ever gonna do that. Okay. They're always going to order the options, least to greatest or greatest to least. And that, again, facilitates this sort of answer choice elimination. It's an invitation for you to take advantage of the multiple choice format and avoid a lot of messy algebra, focus on some arithmetic. So I know C is wrong, and I can infer then that A and B are wrong. So I'm going to test out D now. All right, move on up to D. First, I calculate the, the discounted price. I right, do my 20% off. I get 20 bucks. Now let's see uh, what's my profit. 10 bucks. The crucial test here is $10, 50% of $20. Yes, it is. And we're done. We've got it. To use the correct answer. Now, this is the second algebra word problem that we've done. And with the first one, the trains problem, I showed you the classic algebra approach. Then I gave you the um, uh, the solving the simpler problem, adapting the solution sort of approach, something that your high school teachers never would have taught you. Well, this one I started out with uh, the back plugging strategy, and now I'm gonna I'm gonna show you the pure algebra approach to this. And and for some people, this stuff comes kind of easy, you know, but for a lot of us, uh, it doesn't. A lot of us would prefer an approach like this. And it, again, it's, it's just a good thing that the structure of the exam right, invites these sorts of alternative solutions. But let's, let's see the classic approach, just so you can see right, just how algebraic this word problem was. We can start by throwing out like three equations here. Let's go with D from a discounted price, R from a retail price, and, uh, and P for my profit. Where is it? Yeah. So the equation here for the discounted price, that's 80% of the retail price, that's 20% off. And crucially, we're looking for a profit here, right? That is half of that discounted price. So that's translating there. And profit itself, that would be the retail price minus 10. So I can throw out these three equations if I'm going the algebra route on this. Now I can take an... Um, to simplify a couple of these, right? P is equal to R minus 10. So I can take that P right there and replace it with R minus 10. And then I can take and simplify this so that I've got D in terms of R. And you might anticipate what my next step is, right? I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna plug it in over here so that I'm now able to take and solve for R, able to solve for my unknown. So again, this shows you again, just how algebraic this problem is. These are the classic sort of uh, steps that one could take. This is the stuff that you, know, you would have been expected to do in your high school math homework, and you need to show all this to get full credit. It's something you could do on the GRE. It's something conceivably you could do in a minute and 45 seconds or less. Right? But again, if you know the algebra stuff doesn't come quite as easily to you, we saw that there are alternative approaches. But finishing this one out, yeah, we could take and, and arrive at our answer pure algebra. What, 
what I'm trying to press on you here again is that that's not the only route to the answer. This is the one that you may think is the only route. This is the route that you would have been forced into in your high school math and work, but it's not the route that you have to take on the exam. So let's try another one. We right, got number seven here, the positive integer p is divided by 10, uh, the remainder is four, what's the remainder when 15p is divided by 25? Let me bounce back a couple of slides here. Doing the easy math, swapping some variables for values, analyzing the answer choices. Maybe this one is attractive for the practice problem that we have now, solving the simpler problem. Let's see here. Let's bounce back to it. All right, well, let's see if you can do it. Number seven. And looking good so far. Some right answers coming in. This is a good one to by solving a simpler problem and adapting the solution. The, the central problem for us to solve here is figuring out the value of P. Right? Positive integer P is divided by 10, the remainder is 4. What's the remainder when 15 P is divided by 25? This part is going to be easy. Right? Dividing 15 P by 25 and looking at the remainder. That's going to be easy once we figure out what P is. So let's try simplifying this problem here. The problem at hand is P divided by 10 has a remainder of 4. Well, let's set aside that remainder for a second. Let's, let's say P divided by 10 had a remainder of 0. Right? This would be a simpler case for us to deal with. And there, value of P comes quite easily. Well, P divided by 10 has a remainder of 0 would be some multiple of 10. 100, you know, 50, 20, 10. Okay? Well, how then adapting our solution now, how then would we get a remainder of 4 when we divide by 10? Well, we take our multiple of 10 and we add 4 to it. Now, the in the simpler case here, the smallest value of P is 10. And again, that's the simpler problem where we get a remainder of 0. The problem at hand, right, to get that remainder of 4, the smallest value of P would be 14. This is a value that divided by 10 has a remainder of 4. So we can work with this. There's no reason for us to take and mess with other values of P. Every single value of P divided by 10 has a remainder of 4. Any value of P will do. And again, we'd want to go with the smallest one to keep our math simple. So now on to the easy part. Right? Uh, the easy part of the problem, as given to us, 15 times P, 15 times 14 is 210, divide by 25, goes in eight times with 10 left over. Another good example of, of in solving a simple problem and adapting a solution, recognizing in what the central problem is and homing in on a little piece of that problem that could easily hang us up. You know, and we, we set that aside. We go with something a little simpler. We get some traction in the problem and getting that traction, getting that foothold, it's easy for us to move forward and to figure out the correct answer to the problem as stated. Take a look at, a letter, look at another problem here. Number eight. X and Y are positive integers. Eight times two to the X equals two to the Y. What is X in terms of Y? So let's, let's try this one out. Let's see how you do on number eight. All right, looking pretty good. Lots of right answers coming in. This is another one where you might want to try solving a simpler problem and adapting the solution just to get a foothold. And we're definitely going to use some facts and formulas here that we've got to use our knowledge of, uh, of exponents. But, you know, when I look at this problem, um, a lot of times I find that, that students have some difficulty with that eight right there. They're not, they're not sure what to do with that. And I say, okay, well, let's forget that 8 for a second. Here's a simpler problem for us to think about. Let's, uh, let's get that 8 out of view, in fact. Let's say this was our problem. They had 2 to the x equals 2 to the y. What's x in terms of y? It would be quite easy to get our, uh, our solution there. And x in terms of y, what we're talking about here is you know, x equals some expression. 
with Y in it. We see the candidates and the answer choices. And a quick way to, to get the other half of that equation, if this were the problem, right, we, just, we just bring the, the exponents down and we're good. Right? The bases are equal, so the exponents must be equal as well. But we were not given so simple and easy a problem. We were given this one, right, where it was 8 times 2 to the x equals 2 to the y. So I start thinking, you know, with the simpler problem, what made things so simple and easy was the fact that I had just a single 2 to the something on the left equal to a 2 to the y on the right. So I start thinking, well, can I take that 8 times 2 to the x and consolidate that? Can I take that and get myself a 2 raised to some power? And you can. Right? 8 is identical to 2 cubed. Right? 2 times 2 times 2 gives us 8. So I can take and rewrite the left hand of this equation. And now, apply some facts and formulas, apply a rule here, the products rule. When you've got same base, you take in, add those powers together. So 2 cubed times 2 to the x, the same base, 2. Consolidate those bases and add those powers. And now I've got something like the simpler problem that I wish that I had and that I sort of worked with uh, for a moment. Um, in the more difficult problem here, we can't get ourselves a 2 to the something on the left and a 2 to the something on the right. And with that, just bring our bases down and solve. Get x in terms of y. x is equal to, indeed, y minus 3. Let's see how you do here on uh, number 9. All right, very nice. That's the right answers coming in. This is a good candidate for supplying some numbers. And since it's a word problem, we'll have to do a little translation, a little words to arithmetic in this case, since we're supplying some numbers to replace those variables. So last year, Jan uh, saved 7% of her annual earnings. This year, Jan earned 5% more than last year, saved 2% of her annual earnings. The amount saved this year was what percent of the amount saved last year? Well, these sort of problems uh, that require you to think about percents, and they're, they're a favorite of uh, the test makers, question writers. A good way to tackle them is to supply a value of 100 to get those percent calculations going. We're not told what Jan's earnings were last year, but we can make them a particular value. We can make them 100. And then we can calculate the savings last year. Translating 7% of our annual earnings, that's 7% of 100, would be 7. Now, our earnings this year were 5% more than last year. And remember, we said that last year she earned 100 bucks. So this year, 1.05 times 100, that would be a 5% increase. It was 105. And this year, she saved 2% of her earnings. So that would be 0.02 times 105, and we get 2.1. So the savings this year, 2.1. Savings last year, 7. The amount saved this year was what percent of the amount saved last year? The calculation here would be 2.1 over 7. Give us the decimal value of 0.3, which as a percent would indeed be 30%. All right, nicely done on that one. Let's do one more. Another quantitative comparison. Another quantitative comparison that's about standard deviation. Let's see how you handle this one. Outstanding. Correct answers all around. You can see we learned our lesson well from the uh, standard deviation problem earlier. Putting concepts before calculations here. Standard deviation is a measure of spread or distribution, how spread out uh, the data is surrounding the mean. Now, with these two distributions, it, it may help to think of them as equal but opposite changes to uh, a normal distribution. A normal distribution, we have our classic sort of bell curve shape, right? The, uh, the mean would be right here in the middle, and then you got your data spread out to the left and the right. What happens with distribution A is we take that normal distribution and we skew
skew it on the left, all right? With distribution B, we take the normal one and we skew it to the right. But while this is going to result in different means, here the mean's going to be a little, little closer to, uh, to 10, over here the mean's going to be a little closer to 50, the standard deviation is going to be the same. All right, what we see here is a difference in, in how the distributions are skewed, but that's different from the spread. Right? The data here is equally spread out. This one, it's spread to the left. This one, it's spread to the right. But the spread is equal, and the standard deviations then are going to be equal. All right. Good to end on a high note there. Let me just drop a few more things on you before we go. There is more free prep. There's the GRE Grad School Admissions blog over blog.powerscore.com, GRE. You'll find some practice problems. There are even some, uh, some articles that are dedicated uh, to some of the practice problems that we did uh, in this webinar. We got a brand new GRE forum uh, where you can go and post questions, interact with senior power score instructors, um, and know that there's a ton of stuff there already. Even though it is new, uh, we've posted explanations for all the problems, uh, quantitative and verbal, uh, for the power prep practice tests and for other practice tests that are out there. So if you want to quickly see answers and explanations for all of those uh, questions from the free official practice tests, We've got them over there for you. And again, don't be afraid to, to post a question. We very much appreciate you all coming. Hope you got a lot out of it. Uh, don't be afraid. Take in, reach out. Right again, you can hop into the forum, post a question there, pop on over to our site, check things out. Right? We're glad to help. Again, thanks you all for, uh, for coming. So you all have a good night.